Welcome to Section 3, home to the near nasties and country retreat for neck nibblers everywhere. This episode we have an animalistic alien, lesbians and a whole bunch of British accents. As we jump into a homegrown horror that made the DPP sit up and pay attention. Norma J. Warren makes another entry onto the list with his 1981 film, Prey. An alien makes a landing in an isolated area of England where after killing a couple and stealing a man's identity, he finds himself shacking up with a local couple. The couple, Jessica and Josephine, have very different responses to the visitor, who is by any standards an oddity, vague in his background and mysterious in his intent. The longer he stays, the more Josephine becomes suspicious and resentful of Anders, partly because of Jessica's interest in the stranger, but also because of the odd events that begin to happen around the house. Events that not only begin to drive Josephine and Jessica apart, but events that are bizarre and increasingly bloody. Norm J. Warren is no stranger to the Section 3 list, with no less than three entries in Seminoid, Terror and of course this film. As in the Seminoid, Warren has an interesting take on sexual roles, though here it has to be said it seems to work a lot better. The alien angle, again like in Seminoid, is almost incidental. Anders is a monster. His origins are not really that important. In fact, the most significant element of his alien origin seems to be to disembody him from humanity. So in these terms, it's quite useful. Stinking nuisance. He is not. He's lovely. Sit down, Mr. Anderson. Do you take sugar? I suppose so. Most men do. when you leave here, Mr. Anderson. You must be going somewhere. Are you going to London? Yes, London. What are these for? What does one keep plants for? I don't know. We keep them because we like them. They're beautiful, don't you think? Yes, but I prefer... Wally? Very strange. My father brought them from India or Singapore or something. I'll go and get the eggs. Your tea's getting cold, Mr. Anderson. Oh, yes. Good. What's your first name? Anders. Anders? Anders Anderson? Yes. Nice and poetic. Anders Anderson. Swedish? Anders is not a character in the same way that either of the girls are, and in fact it seems... It's really them that we need to look at to get the context of what the story seems to be doing. The immediately prominent aspect of our female protagonists is in fact that they are lesbians. Obvious maybe, but it strikes me that this is not just to allow for the racy love scenes between the two. I think you should know that Jessica and I are lovers. Joel? No, he must know. Ours is a pure love, without the foul animal function of breeding. I understand. Good. Josephine and Jessica have a very familiar dynamic taking on gender roles that seem to be representative of a more conventional partnership. Jessica is clearly the submissive and more traditionally, at least in story terms, feminine of the couple, but Josephine displays more masculine traits. If it wasn't for the presence of Anders, it would be quite easy to write this off as being a stereotyping of a lesbian relationship, but given what Anders seems to be, it seems that something different may be going on. Anders seems to be raw masculinity. He only eats raw meat. He's kind of primitive, literally animalistic, as it turns out. Please, sit here, Mr. Anderson. We're vegetarians. We are to appreciate the real inner beauty of life. We cannot allow ourselves to behave like animals. I'm sure Mr. Anderson understands that, Joe. The relationship is interesting and plays out well for us because there is this, if you forgive the phrasing, alienation of the gender roles within the female couple, which is then played off against the somewhat symbolic male figure, who is also removed from reality by the more exotic elements of his character. 
His nature is played with somewhat when he's dressed up for a fairly significant chunk of the film in drag. It says something of Josephine, whose idea it seems to be that uh, she needs to be the most masculine in the room. It's kind of a sexual sabotage that Anders doesn't seem to comprehend, and Jessica isn't deterred by. It's this idea of relationships that plays through the film that underpins what's going on here. Josephine and Jessica, despite their unconventional relationship, play out like a dysfunctional traditional relationship. And essentially what we have there is a three-way relationship that develops with Jessica as the cheater, Josephine as the jealous partner, and Anders as the other man. Aside from the girls' gay relationship and Anders being an alien, this is really quite a conventional, familiar story in most respects. It's a love triangle with a twist. This is, however, about as far as anything significant goes. Prey is rather limited in its ambitions beyond what I've mentioned, and for the most part, it does seem to be trying quite hard to stretch out its content. For one thing, the alien subplot is really barely even a subplot. It doesn't do an awful lot other than set up this very strange, kind of surreal, disembodied character and act as a punctuation for the ending. The rest of this film is, by virtue of its padding, likely to come over as being overly concerned with the bedroom antics of the two girls, which, to give it its credit, is rather more realistic in its depiction of woman-on-woman -woman sex than the misty lens treatment that the activity usually gets. I do have to stress at this point that my take on the relationship could easily be interpreted the other way, as if it's purely exploitative, and it's exactly these extensive sex scenes that could justify that thought. There is also Jessica's apparent interest in Anders, which can from some points of view undermine the idea that she is satisfied with the relationship that she has, and that she yearns for male companionships. This said, there are so many things going on in the relationship that she could simply be bisexual and wants out of this smothering relationship. Again, the image of Anders being dressed up as a woman kind of has some more significance in this light, rather than it simply being an oddity of seeing a man in drag. He's raw male nature dressed up in feminine garb, and it's not too big a leap to describe Josephine as such in some ways. But the film isn't quite clear enough about these things to steer it towards a solid commentary. It seems implied, but there are certain things that suggest the opposite. Personally, I lean more towards the former. Prey is a pretty slow film, it has to be said, but not painfully slow, and not because it's run out of things to do. It's more that if you're expecting crazy levels of action, then you're going to be out of luck. Prey is much more of a character piece than it is a film of set pieces. There is, however, an atmosphere to the film that boils under the surface, British sci-fi horrors of the time often carry the same sensation of this half-waking dream, a sort of surrealism that manifests in the music, the editing and the progression of the visuals. And the story, it's something that's difficult to nail down in terms of description. It's an almost indescribable combination of elements that seem to give the film an unmistakably British stamp. And it's something that I truly love about these films. It's quirky, odd, and a nice counterpoint to the much more polished studio efforts of the US. It's a quality that carries through not only Warren's films, but in its peers in the likes of Harry Bromley Davenport's Extra, and so on. With the exception of its signature set piece, Prey is not a particularly explicit film, though there are plenty of moments that feel unsettling and uncomfortable. The throat-ripping scene, for instance, is rather well realised, and possibly because it was one of the very few moments of gore, it stands out in the film. But odd scenes like Anders drowning in the lake and needing to be saved also stay in mind. It's an odd scene to say the least. Anders goes out for a walk and apparently tries to walk over the lake. Being an alien, he apparently didn't realise that being short of divine status, walking on water was not feasible. The scene itself is uncomfortable and rather illustrative of the kind of budget filmmaking we see here, where the actor's welfare is, well, pretty much be damned. That lake looks pretty nasty to say the least and the actors are really getting into their roles in taking in mouthfuls of rather shitty looking water. And that's probably the most truly repulsive thing in this film to be honest and it's certainly one of the most bizarre like a baptism in excrement as if to affirm his less than godlike status. It's rather the oddness of the film that makes it more effective. The danger in the film is provided by two characters, and the only one that's not aware of it seems to be Jessica, who, like the fox, seems to be the game of the story. It's an interesting collection of ideas that make up this film. Do they gel as a cohesive whole? Well, sometimes yes, other times not so much. 
And it has to be noted that the representations can come over as dated. But the exploration of these ideas and situations still, at least to me, seem worthy enough not to dismiss it. The one thing to note, however, is that as a piece of exploitation, it's not really going to push too many of the genre fans' buttons, save for a few moments in the runtime. If you approach Prey for what it is, which is more of a drama than a horror, then it's actually kind of an interesting, surreal experience. Yeah, it's a little slow, as some have pointed out, but the performances are pretty decent, and the story, despite being very small, is significant enough to justify what the film is doing. The characterization can be a little crude at times, but they certainly don't fail to engage the attention. There's a fair amount going on with them, in particular with the women, and the relationship, gay or otherwise, is fleshed out rather nicely. I can happily recommend to watch this film. Just don't expect an action-packed film. That's just not what's here. She's got a better figure than you, too. Thank you. Another champagne. 